Hi, and welcome. This is May Bush, executive coach, speaker, author, and former COO for Morgan Stanley Europe. And I am here today with Keith Ferrazzi, CEO of Ferrazzi Greenlight. And before I properly introduce you, Keith, I want to just take a moment to check in with our audience and see where everyone is joining us from today. So can you just type into the chat where you are joining us from? And uh, we're also going to be using the chat so you can pose questions because Keith has generously agreed to answer questions live. The man has no fear. <laughs> so, <Not> at all. <laughs> yeah. And so we want to make sure that you can uh, access the comments in the chat section. So let's see. Um, Anna from Mexico. Wow. Cool. Let's see some others here. Um, as we are waiting. All right, uh, New York City, Toronto, Harlingen, Memphis. Awesome, I'm gonna be in Memphis next year, Rhode Island, Lithuania, wow. Keith, I was telling you how global we are. I know, um, it's beautiful. Okay, Wynn says there's no sound here. Um, let us know if others can hear uh, from Turkey, Philly, San Fran, Cleveland, so we're really at Vilnius. Um, I think that's Lithuania too, if I'm not mistaken. In Nairobi, this is great. So uh, yeah, thanks everyone for that. And if you cannot hear us, oh, I was gonna say type if you cannot hear us, but that would make no sense at all. <laughs> anyway, well, let me, let me get started while everyone is still typing in where they're coming from. I wanna introduce Keith, who is uh, the, as I said, the chairman of Ferrazzi Greenlight. And, also the Greenlight Research Institute, where he works to identify behaviors that block global organizations from reaching their goals and to transform them by coaching new behaviors that increase growth and shareholder value. And prior to this, Keith was the chief marketing officer of Deloitte and Starwood Hotels. He is the New York Times bestselling author of Who's Got Your Back, Never Eat Alone, and a frequent contributor to Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Fortune, and many other publications. And today we are going to be hearing from Keith about his latest insights in his new book and also New York Times bestseller, Competing in the New World of Work, How Radical Adaptability Separates the Best from the Rest. And Keith and I are going to talk for about 25 minutes or so and then open it up for your questions. And we'll be ending in about 40 minutes or so. So about 10 past the hour. So please type your questions into the chat as we go. My team will be monitoring it and queuing them up for us. I invite you to search for your nugget. Keith is going to, he's just full of rich insights. So, uh, and I'm gonna ask you at the end to share your key takeaway so you are ready. And now let's hear from Keith. Welcome. And um, just to start us off, Keith, you know, you've been talking and preaching for years that industry disruption has been so painful because leaders have failed to adapt. And why is this time different? You know, how has this pandemic finally proved that we can never go back to work? Yeah. At the peak of the pandemic, I kept hearing people say, when are we going back to work? When are we going back to work? And I got so frustrated. And I said, I don't want us ever to go back to work. I only want us to go forward to work. And the principle was that we've been we've been bemoaning and bitching about the fact that, um, you know, work was changing. Future of work conferences have been going on for 20, you know, 20, 30 years. Mm. And all of a sudden we hit this massive inflection point and I wanted to make sure that we leveraged it effectively. Um, so, you know, I hope that this book uh, competing in the new world of work is a is a massive FOMO book for your readers. In that, oh, as in fear of missing out, fear of missing out, because we crowdsourced among 2,000 leaders in organizations what they were doing to reboot their businesses, their styles of leadership, and le using this leverage point to leap forward. So, if you didn't effectively reboot the way you were working, and I actually, my biggest concern, May, is that not enough people did. I'm not seeing enough transformation. We're still clinging to old ways of working in this new world of work. Um, you know, we, we hit one of the most volatile periods that we have experienced over an extended period of time. Even the financial crisis mm -hmm. with all of its volatility didn't have this, this length of constant volatility, right? Yeah. And yet we've been talking about leader or leading our organizations 
as more agile organizations for many, many years. During the pandemic, we practiced something that I called crisis agile. So what is a good agile organization? A good agile organization is one that is constantly assessing what's coming around the corner, both risks and opportunities. We call that foresight, right? And then a, an agile organization then adapts to that information with the, with the most inclusive conversations possible, utilizes that information of what's coming around the corner, risks and opportunities, and adjusts the business, adjusts the team. One might call them pivots, right? That basis, that's three elements. That's foresight, agility, and collaboration and inclusion. Those three things together, those three things together are the core of a radically adaptable company. All of us were radically adaptable. We were all surprised by how, how adaptable we were. But did you cement the principle of radical adaptability into your ongoing workplace? Very few teams did. So that that makes me happy to know that people did adapt, but really a little bit sad to know that we've yeah. kind of gone back to our old ways. Yeah. So talk about how can business leaders, including those of us who have kind of gone back to the, the same old, same old, how can we yeah. reinvent our business models and redesign work when the world is going to keep getting disrupted? Thank you. Um, you know, a really simple and good best practice. I'm going to speak to all of us on this call as team leaders. And a team leader is an individual who has a mission, a goal, and you have a set of individuals that you're working with to achieve it. And may I remember the last time that we got together, it was about my last book, uh, Leading Without Authority. Oops, yep. the Leading Without Authority. And um, Leading Without Authority taught all of us to redefine what a team is. A team is who you need to get your job done. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I want each of you to do is to ask yourself, how frequently are you asking those who are critical to the work that you're doing? How frequently are you asking them for their diagnosis of risks that are going to bite you in the bum? How frequently are you asking them for their diagnosis of opportunities of growth in a hybrid work world? Now, this is a new set of tools we're adapting yeah. in a world where we have zoom meetings and team meetings right and we have breakout rooms and we can open up sharepoint or google documents we can redefine collaboration and inclusion what used to be a meeting would be a set of individuals all in a room sitting there having a conversation one after another after another well the next thing that we can do is we can actually have even broader numbers of people with um with Federal Express, they had a meeting with their top 3,000 leaders, their top mm -hmm. 3,000 leaders. They asked that 3,000 leaders questions, like what are the risks that we're facing during the pandemic? Would they ask them questions? What are the growth opportunities that we're facing? They pushed a button and everybody went into breakout rooms. You open documents where people had small conversations in breakout rooms about risks that they were seeing, opportunities that they were seeing, and then they collected that data. Now, what used to be a one-way broadcast town hall was now turned into a broadly inclusive collaborative problem-solving meeting with the tools that are available to us in hybrid work, Zoom meetings, breakout rooms, Google Docs, et cetera. It redefines the way that we can look around corners and adapt to information that is much broader and inclusive. Next week, I'm going down to visit with the um, La, uh, Lionel, uh, Basel. Lionel Basel, yeah, mm -hmm. and they're doing this with their with their vendors, you know, oh, outside of the vendors. organization, exactly outside of the organization, right? So we can now think much more broadly than we ever have at getting inputs to risk and opportunity, and use your use your power as conveners as leaders to invite people into these kind of co-creations. Now I'll go one step further, which is you don't even have to have a physical meeting to do it. There's, there's a new form of collaboration that was born uh, among high tech startups that was used very frequently called asynchronous collaboration. There's a myth that we saw during the pandemic that all collaboration starts with the meeting. Right. Well, I think that's what we all think, you know, there was a wonderful example I write that right up, which is uh, a guy named uh, 
Gil West, who is the chief operating officer of Delta Airlines. And he went over to become the chief operating officer of Cruise. And at Cruise, he used to, he would, he walked in there and he said the same thing he used to say at Delta. Hey, there's a problem here. We need to have a meeting on it. And then his team said, wait a second, Gil, what do you mean? How can we have a meeting on it? We haven't collaborated enough yet. Isn't that an ironic thing to say? How can we have a meeting on it? We haven't collaborated enough. What they would do is they would get broader conversations happening in the cloud using yeah. asynchronous documents, then see what was really needing to, what are the agenda topics? Who are the people that should be in the meeting? Then they called the meeting. Wow. Then they called the meeting. Not a bunch of extraneous people and, you know, and L, you know, and, and different individuals that didn't need to be there. They went right to the source. What's the agenda? Who are the people that need to be in the room? We were able to, using asynchronous collaboration, companies can reduce the number of meetings they have by 30%, 30%, which is, which wow. is powerful when it comes to freeing up innovation time. Wow. I, I, I'm so glad you said this, Keith, because I'm getting asked by other folks in uh, other uh organizations how do we get rid of all these meetings we're in meeting overload and i don't know if you heard this during from your studies of the 2000 people that you interviewed but i'm hearing that meetings increased during the pandemic yeah zoom i guess they were but it did because it became so easy to schedule meetings one after another after another after another and people were just sitting here going meeting after meeting after meeting well, that was debilitative and it really drained the yeah. energy of our people. We went in and we've designed a set of workshops for leaders to awaken to what used to be poor working myths of collaboration. And how do we reboot those myths into new ways of working? So myth number one, collaboration does not start with a meeting. Use How do you use asynchronous work to effectively collaborate? right? Myth number two, the more people you get involved in collaboration, the slower it is. Well, that was true when you had a mindset that everybody's collaborative input needed to be in physical meetings. So the more people you got involved, getting everybody in a room was slower. Yeah. Except, plus, there was a mindset, which is if you're in the room, your decision, um, it, it, everybody has equal weight. Right. So that created this mushy consensus mindset in many companies, a bunch of people in a room. Everybody thinks they have a right to have their final decision be the decision. And as a result, you get consensus. So people feel that the more people you get involved, the slower it is and the weaker the innovation. But that's not true. The more people you get involved in asynchronous collaboration, the more data you get. And then still a small group of individuals can land the plane with a bold decision. But, but infused by more data. Mm. So, you know, one of the, again, what I had mentioned to you, May, when we spoke last, we were trying to think about, because our primary business, we coach teams. Yes. So anybody who needs their team to be high-powered, hybrid, coached, we coach teams. But we started realizing is we had to start a workshop business because every leader needs to know how to use these hybrid tools better to change the myths and work differently in the hybrid world. So we started this workshop business to do that. Wow. So what are some of the, um, you talked about the myths of collaboration, uh, then how uh, can you talk about this, how the concepts of uh, co-elevation and teaming out fit into this? So yeah, the, the principle of co-elevation co and teaming out gets to the idea. So there's four chapters in, in the new book. Um, the first one is the awakening that the world will continue to be volatile and will continue to need us to have constant foresight, looking around corners for opportunities and risks. We talked about that. But how do we get that? We call it teaming out and inclusion. So the idea is we need to no longer think about the people who give us inputs to make decisions as a tight group of individuals. With hybrid work, we can have hundreds, thousands of individuals involved in the process of innovating. Now, it was very interesting. There were studies done in your, your neck, of the, neck of the woods at Oxford. Yeah. And studies done that showed that during the pandemic, we suffered innovation. We suffered team bonding and, and connectedness. Um, 
And what was interesting is when we went in and looked at that data, there was no discernment among who was using the tools right and who was using the tools wrong. So ah. we just asked a bunch of people, did you feel that innovation suffered during remote work? And everybody said, yes. Well, damn it. There's only 15% of people that were actually using the tools well. <laughs> among that 15% of the people using the tools well, innovation increased because they okay. got a bolder set of inputs to, now that happened to be mostly tech forward companies, IT organizations, where they were used to using, you know, Google Docs and um, and breakout rooms effectively where, where mm. they were using some form of Slack or Teams well, where they were having conversations in the uh, uh, in, in designated rooms instead of playing hunt and go seek with emails and texts, et cetera. Mm. So I know that, by the way, I know it's tough. I mean, my old methodology of communication was text and email and getting you out of that and getting you into um, channel-based communications. You know, my old idea was like gills, throwing meetings, getting you out of that and starting documents asynchronously and getting your people coached to respond deeply to an asynchronous collaboration before a meeting happens, right? Getting people to be out of the mindset where they feel, well, if I don't get involved in that meeting, if I don't get invited to that meeting, I'm not important. So I need to be in that meeting, right? There's all of that going on. Yeah. These are mindset shifts, which is again, why we created that workshop business to start awakening people, shaking them awake to realize that you're just working poorly. Yeah. Well, you know, I was really struck by this comment that only 15% of of the organizations were using the tools correctly yes, and that, that those were the ones who were experiencing innovation during the pandemic. And those were also the ones that were more tech savvy or yes. tech forward. Yeah, they were so, using well. yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering, what are you finding in terms of these other organizations ability to catch up or, um, the first issue is many of them don't even know it. Many of them don't, because you. how do, would you know that you're not using the tools well if you're not using the tools well? <laughs> all right. Yeah, that's right. All you, okay. all, you, all you experience, May, is what you just said, which is people are saying, oh my God, I have too many meetings. They don't know that they could be having a meeting in the cloud without having a physical meeting. Right. right, which they would probably love because they could express their views, see everybody else's views without having to suck up a lot of their time. Now, the one thing that becomes a very important tip when you start moving to asynchronous collaboration, hopefully we're capturing a lot of nuggets. Like I know you love capturing nuggets of insight and action for people. Hopefully yes. we're capturing a number of them here. But one of them is to actually block out time on your calendar for asynchronous work. Oh. It's very important okay. to create, you know, you might call it review time, but it's really your, like, I actually think there's a little trick, which is, let's say I'm, I'm working with my marketing team and they put out a marketing, a new marketing plan. And that new marketing plan is something I have to review. So yeah. What you don't want to do is just let that slip because you're having all of these meetings during the day. Let that slip into what you do on nights and weekends. That's that does not build resilience, which is that final area of resilience and how do we build resilience among teams. But if we put a block of red on our calendar for an hour and say this meeting, even though it's nobody else is there but you, this meeting is my meeting for the marketing plan. Ah, okay. I blocked it on my calendar, right? And now I've got meeting time that nobody else is involved in, but I can go in and see what other people's inputs are. I can comment on their inputs. I can add. It's so important that we begin to schedule asynchronous time. Critical. If we don't schedule asynchronous time, it will always take a back seat and won't get done. I love that. And that's a takeaway for me because I am doing those things on nights and weekends. Which is not fair to you and your family. No, and I'm, it's, it's not my best time to to be on for my team either. Um, okay, so another question then. Um, if you are a team leader, or if I'm a, if you, if someone is a team leader in the middle of an organization, the organization isn't that tech savvy, but 
I feel like my team and I can be. Is this the kind of thing that I could do unilaterally from wherever I sit in the organization, even if I'm in this dinosaur no. organization? Well, Give that's why I we let's go back to this principle of who is a leader. A leader is anybody who has a mission and wants to execute on that mission. So you are a leader. And, and the question is, who's your team? Who are the individuals on your team that you want to start engaging with in this new way? Um, all you've got to do is get a small subset of people to agree to edit a document offline together, right? There's uh, different ways you could do that. You could do uh, a prose document where people are physically editing a, a pre-existing document, you could put a straw dog out and say, this is a, a straw man of what we're working on. Go okay. in and cut it up, you know, edit it, uh, make and use track changes, et cetera. That's one mechanism. Another mechanism is a little simpler. I call it a decision board where people go in and we say, look, what's the decision? What's what we're trying to make? Uh, we're falling behind in manufacturing. Okay, well, what are some bold solutions? So this is the person who owns the, the collaboration would say, here's the problem we're trying to solve for. Here are some bold solutions we're considering. Think of it as a spreadsheet in this case. Yeah. Right? Then um, what are some of the change management challenges with it? Who should be involved in the discussion? Write that in the top of the spreadsheet. Then you send it to everybody you want to have involved in the conversation and you have them write their rows where they're commenting on each other's comments. So you can see it's like, oh, I, I think this is the problem, not this is the problem. I think here's a solution, not this, not as opposed to this solution. So people are now debating against each other like a conversation, but in, in a spreadsheet, right? Then you say, okay, now we're all done. Everybody go back one more time and look at it in case you didn't see other people's comments, right? Now you land it and you're like, okay, on that far column, who else should be involved? Let people pass it around to other people. Mm. So what, what used to maybe have been a 12-person meeting can now be a 35-person spreadsheet document. And now the leader step back, and uh, you step back and look at it and like, hmm, here's some ideas, here's some people. Huh, I should have a meeting with these four people. And they might not have been the original eight that you were thinking of. Right. But I need a meeting with these people to talk about this subject. Now you can schedule the meetings with the input. So again, okay. all of this is this idea of leading differently in a hybrid work world. These are tools that we all have to learn. We all have to learn. Yeah. And, and the, the tools themselves are simple. I, I, I just keep coming back to that mindset yes. shift that you talked about. That's the hard tools part. Tools are simple. It's the application. Yeah. It's the application. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you, you, let, let's just touch on one more thing before we uh, open it up for questions. Please. You talked about resilience as well. So is there- Yeah, let's, let's talk about that. It's a good timing because as we sort of round out the hour, um, I want to get to this. People are fatigued. People were fractured. People were frustrated. Energy was low. People were just in tears at times, right? Um, yeah. And, the, and, and you look at that and you say, that is, a, that is an earmark of remote work. People will be frustrated. People won't be able to collaborate as effectively. The people aren't as connected and as bonded. Bullshit. Not true. Once again, we go to people who use the tools differently. So let's say we started this meeting like we just did. We dove right in and started talking about content. What if you had asked me the question, um, Keith, what are you struggling with these days? Right? Uh, or Keith, what's your energy like these days? Mm. If you start, if you, if, you, if you bring vulnerable conversations proactively into the room, you bond a group of individuals. As we all know, vulnerability is the key for, to opening empathy in relationships. Mm. And if we had started talking about energy, I would actually say my energy is low because I am repositioning my company for scale. We've had a lot of success with the hybrid teams coaching that we're doing. 
And I'm struggling with the right leadership models in my own organization to bring this into the market with the velocity of interest that there is there. And so it's been, it's been a lot on me and I need to shift that. We're hiring, right? So if there's anybody out there that wants to run a division of our company, please reach out to us. Um, and th this is, this is, this has been weighing on me, right? Or I could talk about my foster son, which, you know, I mean, and I think we were struggling with him the last time and he got yeah. kicked out of another rehab. I mean, this has been really challenging for our family. Um, so if you ask the right questions and hold space for people to show up as their authentic full selves, those teams do not lack the connectedness and bonding that the data says. Mm. Leaders need to lead differently in the hybrid world. This kind of conversation would have happened in a hallway, right? Yeah. Not in a meeting. Oh my gosh. You, a big light bulb just went off. Can you see it over my head? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Right. I, I'm also hearing from people just this point is like, oh, yeah, we, we miss those serendipitous hallway and coffee machine yeah, conversations. And this is a brilliant way to build them in. You just do it at the start of your meeting yeah. Yeah. or your conversation. I love it. I love it. OK, well, um, thank you so much, Keith. Let's let's turn to questions from our audience. My team is going to pop up questions for us. I think we have some. Okay, so uh, I'll just read it out, Keith. What yeah. are some best practice strategies you've heard from leaders who are effectively leading while managing unexpected circumstances and demanding more from an overwhelmed or depleted workforce? Well, this is a lot of what we've been talking about, isn't yeah. it? It is. So what are some I best can... practices? Let me see for... if I can pick some of the best practices. Um, yeah. You know, I think the most important thing is for every question you have within embedded in this, managing unexpected circumstances, have a portion of your agenda where you pause and you, you, I, mean, I don't even think, yeah, I wouldn't even say a meeting agenda because we talk about asynchronous, have a, have a portion of time where you ask these questions of the broadest group of people you're working with. So sending out a message on Slack that says, you know, um, what are we most, what are the, what are the most important risks we should be attending to right now? You know, these unexpected circumstances, what are the most important risks we should be attending to and collect that data, hmm. right? And this overwhelm um, for depleted workforce, bring energy by de decreasing the number of meetings and giving people that extra time to be thoughtful in their work, or frankly, to go on a walk and get a workout, right? I mean, well-being needs to be programmed into our schedules, just like meetings do. Those would be yeah. some suggestions. Thank you, that's awesome. All right, team, let's go to our next uh, question. Okay, from... A I'm going to attempt to pronounce your name and I'm apologizing in advance for getting it wrong. Edima Inwang, uh, how do you unravel the concept of trust in collaboration? We've heard a lot of leaders complain about the fact that members of their team may not be trusted to contribute fully when they are not supervised or physically in a meeting. And I'll just add to that this awful stuff of uh, crawling through your computer, having these AI bots checking to see whether you're at your computer, moving your mouse. Yeah. Yeah. The biggest challenge that leaders uh, had at the beginning of the pandemic was, how do I know if my people are working? And the problem with that is that's not the problem of the employee. That's the problem of the manager. In that if you don't have, if you haven't negotiated with your employees, clear weekly outcomes, then then you would worry whether they're at their desk or they're working. Mm. But the reality is there are people who could be in the office at their desk, looking like they're working and getting very little done. Yeah. FaceTime. And FaceTime. You need to be managing to outcomes. And that's what agile taught us. Agile is a weekly 
or biweekly negotiation with an employee or a team on what they're going to achieve. If we negotiate clearly objectives, what you're going to achieve this week. So what I do is asynchronously, each of my critical team members sends me a voice message on a weekly basis. What have they achieved? Where were they struggling? And what are they going to try to achieve next week? And I get that every week. I like voice message. I like to, because I'm always on the run and I like to listen to these things, whether I'm driving, whether I'm you know walking through an airport. So I don't have as much sitting reading time to be able to read reports. I'd rather hear them. Mm-hmm. And then I hear them and then I just shoot a voice text or voice message back through Slack or whatever. And so these critical, these critical voice messages And then, by the way, what happens if somebody, if I put these voice messages in Slack, what happens if somebody leaves? The new person that comes on board to take their job, they just listen to all the voice messages and they've seen the whole set of activities this person was working on. Wow. That is really powerful. And it sounds like you like voice messages. Others might like written messages, whatever suits you as the leader. All right. Great question. Thank you. Let's go to the next question, team. Okay. Anna asks, what would you suggest to beat inertia from the organization and how do you produce change? Well, that's a big loaded question and very important and hard to. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I I actually have a a simple answer. The answer is it's not training, it's coaching because, Mm -hmm. you know, you pick an area. So I'm the inertia. I don't know what inertia and what change you're looking for. But I would say the two greatest levers to pull for stagnancy or momentum of bad momentum of the past is to identify the individuals who are ahead of their peers, bring them together and give them coaching to be even better. And once they have shown themselves to really be able to create a replicable best practice, then let them go and keep teach their peers. So I, you know, it's very similar to what we did with TQM, Six Sigma, continuous improvement. We made black belts of Six Sigma. Oh, okay. So who are your black belts? And then the black belts taught their peers. Same model can be used for any change. Wow. And, and how do you um, get the peers to listen to you when you're a peer? So I, I wrote a book called Leading Without Authority because the intention was if you really want to be a change agent in the organization, you've got to earn the right to be heard. And that is through relationships. And there's an entire set of work that you have to do to earn the, peer, the right to be a, a peer coach. That's why I wrote Leading Without Authority. Highly recommend that book too. Uh, Okay, let's uh, get the next question here. From Scott, how would you apply these principles in a public school setting? Would there be much difference from the business setting? Yeah. No, I don't know the answer to that. Actually, one of my associates runs her own business, helping bring coaching and training to public schools. And and she does, she works part-time for us and then part-time she runs her own business. Which I, by the way, love that today in this new hybrid world of this gig worker, people can have a very robust life full of variety and, and risk mitigation and optionality. I love that. I've got people working in my company that are part-time that I could never afford to hire part-time full-time because of their depth of expertise, but I can get nuggets of them. Anyway, but... Um, she tells me that very much the work that we do applies at the principal and quote team level. And you think about, so the management of the school, and then you think about teachers as being a critical constituency, like a sales force, et cetera. So a lot of the principles that we, we write about in competing in the new world of work um, apply in nonprofits, governments, uh, public schools as well. Yeah. And I I would just add my own observation uh, that it seems to me that this, what you're talking about is really about people 
and wherever we may be working. And their work habits. And their work, and their work habits. habits, yeah. So I, I, I could see why your colleague um, would, would have said that it definitely applies. You might use different language and so forth. Awesome, yeah. thanks, Scott. Um, I think we have at least one more question here. Okay, why do you think leaders are not naturally doing the bonding approaches already? Oh, love this question. You know, I think we have this old mindset, again, this a myth that business is business, personal is personal. Yeah. And the reality is it's not true. I mean, um, we've always gotten personal with some people in the business. We've always built that empathy <clears throat> accidentally um, or serendipitously. I'm just telling people to do it purposefully. Um, so what we used to do by accident, now I'm asking you to do on purpose. And um, so I just think it's been old habit. The, those conversations happened in the hallway. They happened. They happened in the hallway. Now we need to be more formal about them and ingrain them into our meeting habits because of the, uh, the hybrid work world. Yeah. And in some ways, it's just grooving new neural pathways, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I'd also observe... There were some in in person leaders who weren't doing a lot of bonding either. <laughs> exactly, exactly, and that and by the way, and you would probably see relatively low engagement levels among those teams. Yeah, yeah. Okay, do we have other questions, team? Okay, since coaching has such an important role in workplace and life success, how can one bring coaching as a learned tool in early educational institutions? So another education segment question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'd say the same thing. I mean, the book, I believe, I believe the book follows um, and and just, you know, obviously a different definition of team and work environment. Yeah. And, and it seems to me like maybe the question is also about, um, can you hire coaches to come in? Um, but there are coaching groups that would serve yeah. higher uh, public yeah. education, right? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. And you can also get trained as a coach yourself um, in some way, shape or form. But to do the work that Keith's doing, it, it, it would be your colleague, I guess. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Time for one more question. Yep. Any, do we have one more question or if not, we can do a wrap. I don't see any more questions. Uh, okay. One last question. Oh, no, that was a question we already did. Okay, well, it seems like we have uh, covered everybody's questions. And I'll just end with this one, Keith. What, you know, what is What do you most hope people will take away from reading your book? I think the biggest thing is that your old assumptions of how you worked, meetings, our collaboration, et cetera, the old assumptions for how you work need to be rebooted. And this book gives you a guide map not only for how you to reboot your own work, but how you can be an evangelist in your organization and be a superhero. I mean, all of, all of your companies need this. We need to reboot. And you can be the, the advocate. You can be the evangelist. Um, it's your opportunity to lead without authority. It doesn't matter. Just start practicing in this new way and, and bring that to your organizations. I love that. So from wherever you sit, please exactly. take the lead. <laughs> We need you. The organization needs you. The world needs you. So just to close, I want to uh, give people an opportunity to order the book. Uh, we'll put the link. The team will put the yeah. link in. Yeah, and, and on the workshop side, we're, we're coaching uh, teams all over the world now in being more effective hybrid teams. Just go to Farazi Greenlight. Farazi Greenlight is our company. And just send us a message. Send us an email and let us know uh, that you may need some support uh, in coaching your organization and your leaders and your teams in these new rules of working. Fantastic. And uh, as we as we close out, I just want to ask everybody to type in your biggest takeaways. I'm sure that yeah. Keith would be interested in knowing yeah. what you have taken away from this uh, really cool conversation with Keith. And uh, as we're waiting for people to type in their takeaways, I do see that um, a, uh, someone has, A.B. Ravi Kiran, 
uh, apologize for pronouncing your name incorrectly if I have, that you, is this a question, how to handle people in the remote? I mean, I think the question of handling people, I think it, the answer is purposefully. Everything you do in a remote world needs to be more purposeful. In the olden days, we had old ways of working. Like I said, the meeting after the meeting, the walk down the hallway, et cetera. We need to make it much more purposeful. That's the big shift. Everything you did before needs to shift to purposeful. Now we delineate what that means and it's in the book. Fantastic. And Frank says everything comes down to relationships and being hybrid and remote is no reason to not keep building those. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I would encourage you to um, buy Keith's book and read it. It's really fantastic. And uh, I believe you can get a free video course that yep. comes along with it when you order the book. So um, Keith, I want to thank you very sure. much for your time. And I want to thank all of you for showing up. When you show up, you invest in yourself. So take this knowledge and go and do something with it. And in the meantime, um, this is Mae Bush and Keith Ferrazzi. Keep learning, keep growing, and keep going. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Mae.